I'm Dr. Jess Wright. I'm from the University of Louisville, where I'm the director of the Depression Center, which is, just I'll say a few words about Depression Centers in case you're not familiar with the concept before we get going with the talk tonight. Uh, there are 26 around the country, and they're all at major universities. Uh, there's one at Harvard, there's one at Stanford, one at the University of Cincinnati right up the street, uh, Iowa, Michigan, and other major universities. And our idea is to band together to try to attack mood disorders, depression, anxiety disorders, and, and other conditions in the same way that cancer centers attack cancer. And if we go back 25 or 50 years, or however far you want to go, when somebody got a diagnosis of cancer, it usually kept it pretty quiet, didn't it? And today, still, when you get a diagnosis of depression or anxiety or something else, most people keep it pretty quiet. And you can see why, but that's a bit of a problem. Uh, because you may not get the treatment you need. We know that it's true for doctors. There's a, a, it's actually a movie on this called Suffering in Silence about doctors who won't go get treatment because they're afraid that if they do, you know, somehow it'll interfere with their ability to work, their licensure or whatever. But we're trying through the National Order of Depression Centers to reduce the stigma with illnesses and also to better understand these illnesses, do research that helps us divide, find uh, new treatments develop the best treatments we can and deliver to as many people as we possibly can. We also have a big educational mission, and that's one of the reasons we're here tonight. So we have these uh, public presentations, usually about every month. Uh, we have lots of courses for doctors and nurses and other clinicians to try to help them learn how to do the best job they can with depression and other related illnesses. And we're doing a lot of research. But tonight's talk is on procrastination. And uh, I'm assuming that those of you who came might have had some personal experience with it. I don't know. I certainly have myself, so I, I can speak from experience. And as we go through the slides and the talk, I hope that you'll chime in and give your perspectives and uh, you'll answer some questions if I throw some out to you. Uh, now, before I go on, I do want to introduce our speaker for the next Building Hope presentation, which is right back here, the laugh doctor himself, Dr. Clifford Cohn. So on the 15th of February, in the same place, I think it'll actually be in the bigger room because Cliff tends to get much bigger crowds than I do, uh, we'll have a presentation. What's the, what's, the title? Of mine. What's, what's the title of your presentation, Cliff? It's called uh, Another Perspective on Humor and Healing. Okay. It, it'll be something that'll be very uplifting and uh, full of some humor. Uh, now, my talk uh, will pay against Cliff's because I'm not much of a jokester, but I do like to weave a few little cartoons and things into this to give, uh, to take uh, the edge off on a, on a night like tonight. So we're going to start with a few of those things. Uh, here's some uh, quotes that I found on procrastination. Some of you may be familiar with Alex Jenneris, who actually has a, you can see her on YouTube, a video of her uh, talking about procrastination. She says, procrastinate now, don't put her off. <laughs> And then Mark Twain, never put off till tomorrow what may be done day after tomorrow, just as well. <laughs> and then Bill Waters, and I like this one, you can't turn on creativity like a faucet. You have to be in the right mood. What mood is that? <laughs> Last minute panic! <laughs> and you know that feeling, don't you? Yeah. You know, you put off the paper you're writing or some other project, it's the very last minute, and then you get your act together to do it. And some people find that actually works pretty well for them some of the time. But as an overall strategy, it's not the greatest strategy, is it? Yeah. Let's take a look at a few more. These get a little more serious. You may delay, but time will not. <laughs> Procrastination is a thief of time. Cholera. And then, really a pretty scary one. <laughs> Only put off to tomorrow what you're willing to die having left undone. Uh, Whoa! You want to take that one to bed with you? <laughs> Would you ever get to sleep at night? <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't. So I don't take these things directly to heart, but I think they are. They do offer some different perspectives on procrastination. Here's a couple more, I think. Every duty which is bidden to wait returns with seven fresh duties at its back. Man, putting off an easy thing is, makes it hard. Putting off a hard thing makes it impossible. And until you value yourself, you will not value your time. Until you value your time, you will not do anything with it. There's some wisdom in that. Isn't it? So part of procrastination can be your self-concept, your self-esteem, uh, trying to build that up and make it as, as productive as possible. So as you might imagine, there have been lots of attempts to try to help people with this problem. And I just did a quick survey of some of the self-help books that are out there. Anybody ever look at a self-help book for procrastination? 
couple people. Anybody ever read a self-help book on depression? I want to see all the hands come up because I wrote one. Way to go, way to go, I like it. Okay, that's good. Anybody read a book on laughter and medicine? I read a couple of cliff heads if you will tell you about his presentation in a month. So here are a couple of titles here. Procrastination, why you do it, what to do about it, how to control, how to get control of your time and your life, the procrastinator's handbook, mastering the art of doing it now, the One Minute Manager. It's about time. The Six Styles of Procrastination, How to Overcome It All. The Procrastinator's Success Kit. That's a good one. The Now Habit. A Strategic Program for Overcoming Procrastination and Enjoying Guilt-Free Play. That sounds pretty good too, doesn't it? Overcoming Procrastination. I'll Do It Tomorrow. How to Stop Putting It Off and Getting It Done Today. And I think we have three more here. This is a popular topic, isn't it? Put your rear into gear. <laughs> That's an inspirational title, isn't it? <laughs> the Tomorrow Trap, Unlocking the Secrets of the Procrastination Protection Syndrome, and the Complete Idiot's Guide to Overcoming Procrastination. That one makes you feel really great, doesn't it? <laughs> that you're a complete idiot because you can't get out of this procrastinating habit. So anyway, here we are with a blank slate. So how do we attack procrastination? This person says the trend in tough economic times is to put up everything that doesn't require media action, as this chart shows. <laughs> so, any of you ever been in a place where like it's a blank chart and you're not quite sure where to start? So, where are the answers to this? Uh, that's what, that's the heart of the talk. So, here's my answer, and this is my answer to lots of things because this is a very effective treatment approach. Some of you know about this and read about it. Uh, understand what I'm talking about. For those who haven't uh, been uh, instructed a bit on CBT, I'll give you a few of the key principles. And then we're going to move on to how we might use this to overcome procrastination. So cognitive behavior therapy is the most heavily researched form of psychotherapy for illnesses like depression, anxiety, uh, eating disorders, even schizophrenia now. It works for schizophrenia in addition to medication. There are over 400 controlled studies. That means that a researcher has randomly assigned people to cognitive behavior therapy or to a placebo or to some other control group. So it's been really heavily researched. More than even most doctors realize. They think that psychotherapy hasn't been researched very much, but it really has. It's practical, it's common sense, and it targets thought and behavior patterns involved in procrastination. So here's a cartoon that I really like because it captures the essence of CBT. So Charles Schultz was a brilliant uh, observer of human condition, and he also, I think, must have been trained in CBT. So here he has psychiatric help, five cents. You know, managed care has hit psychiatry really badly, hasn't it? Psychiatrists don't get paid much anymore. Now it's even gone down to five cents a visit. But anyway, here she has her doctor shop set up, and she says, all right, Charlie Brown, let's put it another way. Life is like a grocery cart. Doesn't that sound great? A grocery cart? Each of us has a grocery cart. And the world is our supermarket. The world is filled with wonderful things, Charlie Brown. Push your cart right down the aisle. That grocery cart is your life. Push it, Charlie Brown. Push it right up to the checkout counter. Which one, he plaintively asks. I think I have six items left. <laughs> OK. Well, does that tell you anything about how he thinks, which is cognition? That's the cognitive part of cognitive behavior therapy, and how he behaves. Sure. So here he has this wonderful opportunity that if you weren't depressed, you might be pretty encouraged by it. You might start fantasizing about all these things you want to do. And then you might actually try to do some of those things. So you look at Charlie, and my goodness, he has these, it's really a negative construction on it. I think I have six items or less. Look what happens to his mood. His mood sags, doesn't it? He's depressed, he's down. Look at his shoulders, they're sort of slumped there. So you can't see him really taking up this, this opportunity and making much out of it. So it really captures the essence of, of cognitive behavior therapy. This is uh, from one of our books. We've written some books on this topic. Uh, it's a real simplified uh, concept of what happens uh, when events in our lives seem to trigger thinking. So since we're human beings, if something happens to us, we always tend to try to make some sense of it, we make some meaning of it. Even little things that happen to us. Even tonight, you know, when I came here, the only person that was here was Cliff. 
and Kathy, who's filmmaker back there, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and I was suddenly thinking, well, it would just be the two of us. They even said something like that, didn't it? Well, at least there are two of you here. I was trying to help myself out, but it's good that you people so came, so I feel a lot better about it right now, since we have a pretty good audience here tonight. But I could have, if I was prone to anxiety or depression, really prone to it, I might have really been almost defeated before you even started, wouldn't I? I'd be really down, I'd be discouraged. Who knows, I might even have given up and gone home because I didn't want to face the fact that nobody would show up. So that's the kind of thinking and behavior that goes along when people get into things like depression, where they procrastinate. And if you remember the, the cartoon with Charlie, the event was he was uh, asked to go down this grocery cart of life by Lucy. And his cognitive appraisal is, I think I have six items or less. That means his thoughts that he has in his mind. And his emotion is, looks like sadness, doesn't it? Discouragement. And then the behavior matches that. So his behavior is he doesn't do anything. He just sort of slumps. So let's do one more. I like this one, too. This song always depresses me. It brings back such sad memories. You know what I mean? I've never heard another song that depresses me the way this one does. Play it again. <laughs> now, what, what point are we trying to get at when we, we show that? How does that relate to procrastination, you think? Yeah, well, what I'm trying to get across is that we get into these behavior patterns that we get stuck in. We do them over and over, and each time we do them, they seem to get reinforced. And it's not that we really like them like this. I mean, who likes to procrastinate? Yeah, but it's, it's, the way, it's the way your life is. And so what can we do to break out of that? So here are the key elements of CBT. We want to identify these distressing, unproductive, self-defeating thoughts. In CBT, we call them automatic thoughts, because they sort of just pop in your head just like that. You know, you're in the middle of something. It's this internal dialogue you have. I bet most of you, if you think about your thoughts during the day, that more of them are private ones that are just sort of rolling around in your head than they are ones you speak out loud, right? And they're ones, if you had any depression or anxiety, that may be loaded with uh, worrisome kinds of things or punitive things toward yourself or questioning things. And uh, that's what we run around with. So we have, to, we have to identify those and see if we can do something to turn them around. So we want to check them for accuracy. And we do something called examining the evidence. That is, is this thought really 100% accurate, or is this just part of the anxiety or depression? And we'll do this with procrastination. We're going to show you that in a few minutes. We try to spot something called cognitive errors, which I'll show you in a few minutes. And we develop rational, realistic thoughts. And then we look at our behavioral patterns. If we're avoiding things, and then we have to figure out a way to break through that avoidance. So here's some examples of thoughts that promote procrastination. Do any of these uh, sound familiar? Anybody ever had one of these? I can do it tomorrow. How about that? Anybody ever have that one? OK. How about I'll screw it up anyway, so we'll even try. Yeah. It'll be too hard. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Just it's overwhelming hard. I just can't do it. If I do succeed, there will be pressure on me to do even more. If you admit that one, <laughs> I have that one, you know, because yeah. I've had a few successes in doing things, and I feel like I do something down at my job at the university where I'm supposed to write. You know, they have this thing called publish or perish for, for a professor. <laughs> Kurt knows about that, don't you, Kurt? <laughs> and you publish something and say, great, but then they want more, don't they? Yeah. They want even more. If you get a little grant or something to do a research project, great. When are you going to get the next one? So, that can become a problem. How about I've tried before and not succeeded? That's so common, like with diets, stopping smoking, stopping drinking, or cutting down your drinking, things like that. You know. I'm lazy, that's really self-condemning. Everyone else has their act together. That's really common, you compare yourself to other people and see them as much more successful than probably they really are. You think, well, they, they can really manage this and I can't do it at all. I need to let things go until the last minute to get motivated talked about that one before, is that's the only way to get things done. Anybody ever do that? Okay, yeah. So we have some hands here. Now, I, I'm sure I missed all kinds of thoughts that are associated with procrastination. So now it's open field here. I want you to think of, suggest any other thoughts that you may have had or someone else may have had that would promote procrastination. Anyone want to give us a try? 
Yes, Kurt. One that has plagued me all my life is the belief that uh, if I do it tomorrow, I'll do it better. Ah, okay. And that's, I hadn't had that. I'll, I'll have to add that one. That's a good one. Okay. Yes. This related to what he just said. Uh, I, I need to read one more book so I'll know more than I know. So there's always another book to read before you actually go and try to do it. Right. Yeah. Okay. How about some other ones? Yeah. Well, kind of with the last one, I, I work better under pressure. Yeah. Is that true, do you think? No, until a, a speaker says that it's really a compound. <laughs> 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 so this is I work better under pressure. I think you had one too. I'm not in the mood. I'm not in the mood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how about I, I think I have one of these a little bit later, but I have to have this substance in my system to be able to do it. Like I have to have coffee, or I have to smoke, or I have to drink, or I have to take cocaine, or marijuana, or something like that. Uh, that can be involved with these things too. It can get in the way of, of productivity. How would you say the substance is? Uh, it's already inside all life, or it's inside you. Yeah. In your practice, you learn from your peers and your patients. You mean the substance that allows you to break through procrastination? The flow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, nor does anybody. I, I just have a few tips from my experiences from CBT. But there may be just some temperament, things you're born with. Like some people appear to be more easily able to make priorities and go out and just take action and get things done, and other people not so much. And that may not be just willpower or using properties of CBT, it may be just the luck of the draw. Right? Just like some people have musical talent, and some people don't. Some people are skilled with athletic things, and some are not. Like I was never skilled athletically, I was, you know, tried to play basketball and I wasn't a ended the third string bench and gave up when I was in junior high school. But I was able to sing, so I sang in the church choir. I sing in the church choir right here. So, you know, we all have our attributes, and some of us have a little bit better the way to do these things than others. Yes, Cliff? But that second one, uh, there's a deeper one that, uh, that I uh, struggle with all the time. Yeah. It's not so much uh, messing up uh, so it's not worth the effort. It's when I mess up, uh, people won't like me, people will yeah. mock me, I'll be humiliated, and, and so there's a real fear behind that. Yeah, that's a very good point, that there'll be really negative things yeah. that will come out of this, that people won't like me, people will laugh at me, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I think there's kind of an extension to that, which is kind of perfectionism, saying if I don't do it perfectly, but it's ah, not Yeah, not great, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. yeah, if I don't do it just right, yeah, it's, it's not worth doing at all, I shouldn't do it. Sure. Well, I think we get the point here, there's lots of thoughts that we can carry around in us that may promote procrastination. And if we're going to get over it, we have to learn what those thoughts are and see if we can do something about them. So here are some things in, in cognitive therapy. We call these cognitive errors because they're errors in logic and they're grouped into some categories. And I just thought I'd go through a few more, see if they make any sense to you. There's one that we call ignoring the evidence it's, or tunnel vision. It's where you just zone in on one piece of the available information and don't look at the rest of it. It would be like a scientist that did a research study and had a hypothesis and collected all these data, but then at the end just looked at the little piece of data that confirmed what that scientist believed to be what was going to happen. It threw everything else out. So here's an example. I have no motivation to clean the basement. It would be drudgery. It would be pure work. So if you were a therapist helping this person or a coach, or it was your son or your daughter or your dad or mom or somebody, what ideas do you have for them that would break through that tunnel vision? Could you help them see that there's some kind of opportunity here they're missing? What do you think? For yes. me, it's the result of it. Yeah. I, I may not want to do it, but I know the result of it. Okay, if you say to yourself, I'm really not motivated, but if I got going and did it, I would feel a whole lot better. So that's motivating in and of itself. Yeah, I like that one. And you might find that thing you lost three months ago in terms of some pile. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible. Right. So you might miss that. You, you might ask the question, uh, any good feelings when things do get put in order? You say, sure, I really like it when I've done the dishes or when the, everything's in order in my closet. So then you, again, reinforce that there's some value in this. It's not pure drudgery. Uh, how about another question? Uh, anything that you could do while you're cleaning the basement that would make it less drudgery? 
So now we're starting to drill down on this thought and figure out some ways around it. Any other ideas for this thought? I was yeah. going to say, put off something else while I clean. So if I have an assignment or something, <laughs> I can <do> it. <laughs> yeah, you can trick yourself. You say, well, I don't have to do my uh, schoolwork because I can get the basement clean or something like that. Yeah, that might work, but there's also some downsides to that. Yeah. Maybe it works just do a little bit of time, like say, since you're doing the whole base, you just work it for like 30 minutes each day. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. We're going to come to that a little bit later. So I think you can already see that if you're if you're trying to coach yourself, you may spot those thoughts and then begin to chip away at them. Here's another one, jumping to conclusions. That's where before you even think about how you're going to do it, the conclusion's already reached, and then you give up. So this one says, this person says, I won't be able to stick with a diet plan, so why start it in the first place? So we'd have to work on that one. Let's take another one here. This is a cognitive error called all or nothing thinking. That's tending, tending to think in black and white. Like you always use words like never or always. And when you do that, it's almost always an indication that you're headed for trouble. So here's an example. I would have to do that quote perfectly. It's, otherwise, it's not worth trying. This is the perfectionism thing I think you mentioned to me. Ted has his life in control, mine is going nowhere. Now, can you spot all the all or nothing kind of absolutistic quality of that thinking? So if you hear that in your own thinking, then that's an indication you should step back and say, is there another way that I can see it? Do you yeah. think that our language, our spoken language, is not reflecting the way we're thinking? The language itself. Yeah. You say this or this, this and this. Because that separates them. It's yeah. not with, it's not integrated. Yeah, I like that point. Is is our the language that comes out of our mouth that's communicated to other people, is that the same as the internal language? And it may not be. Uh, in fact we may launder it, edit it, revise it. So we do need to look at the thoughts that are inside, the ones that are the real thoughts that we're having about the situation. Do you do you ever think that like with the quilt thing and the perfectionism, do you ever think, or I, I say this time, I used to use perfectionism like, you know, I wanted it perfect. Mm -hmm. Then when I really got honest with it, it was more of using it as a cop out. You know, I could say that that's the reason I don't do something because I want it really perfect. Yeah. But the thing of it might be is, you know, I, I don't. I just really don't want to do it. Yeah. You know, and I can say I'm trying to, yeah. you know, I'm so perfect, I want to do it perfect. Yeah, so you're fooling yourself a bit with that one, aren't you? Yeah, I, yeah. I think I've done it with other words. Too, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Let's take a look at a couple more. Here's a cartoon. I, I like this one because it shows that sometimes these cognitive errors can be used interpersonally as almost fighting tools or ways of communicating to others. And so, here this fellow is sitting down trying to read his paper, and apparently his wife must have just harangued him about going to this sing-along of Handel's Messiah. And he says, not wanting to go to a sing-along of Handel's Messiah is not the same as never wanting to go anywhere at all. She must have said, you never want to do anything. Can you imagine just being on top of him saying that kind of thing? Yeah. 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 So these cognitive errors that we use against ourselves, we can also use against other people. So do you have anybody in your life that's also a procrastinator? Or doesn't get things done. And what do you say to that person? What do they say to you? So if you're in a, if you have a partner or you're in a family with kids or you know, a spouse or whatever, you can use these not only on, with yourself, but trying <coughs> try to help the communication among others. Unfortunately, these cognitive errors are used a lot in uh, public discourse. Uh, if you pick up a newspaper, there's a lot of absolutistic stuff on it. If you hear tweets, you sometimes hear a lot of all or nothing kinds of things coming out of those, which can be unfortunate because uh, they can really rile you. They can stir passions and emotions that can cause trouble. Here's another one that I think uh, Kurt gave this to me. I'm glad you came here. This is my friend Kurt Barrett, who I worked with for years. And he gave me this once, and I really love it. It says Edward Jones Windward, colossal failure. <laughs> so, you can see the statue that was put up in the park, and uh, that's an example of uh, a cognitive error where he's not looking at any of his strengths, is he? He's, he's maximizing to the hilt all of his weaknesses and problems, and uh, in fact he's even created the statue of himself in the, in the park. So this is, one, this is one of the books that we've written called Breaking Free from Depression that I wrote with my daughter Laura, who's a family physician at the University of Vermont. 
And if you're interested in reading more about cognitive behavior therapy and applying it for depression and other conditions, it would be a self-help book that you can use. So I get a chance to have a little plug, and then I'm moving on. So here are some be behaviors involved in procrastination. We've been talking about thoughts for now. They're the cognitive part of CBT. Now we're going to talk about the B part, the behavioral part. And here are some things that I've noticed. Procrastination has become a habit. It's, it's encrusted. It's what you do. You've been doing it for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 70 years in my case. Um, difficulties with organization and time management. You, know, you just can't seem to get organized to get things done. You're going to start an exercise program, but you know there's no, no place in the, in the schedule for it. There's too much other stuff going on, too much chaos, whatever. Problems with setting effective goals and priorities. <coughs> um, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, about how you set effective goals. Problems with persistence of effort. This is really common. You get an idea, you stick, you start it out, but then persisting and staying with it becomes problematic. You have a lot, you're multitasking, you have all kinds of things in your life. You know, you're a, a middle-aged person that's in a marriage and you have kids and a job and you're trying to see some of your friends and all this stuff's going on and it's hard to, to make change in your life in the midst of all that. Getting to real weather activities. I've had people that come to me and the main problem with their procrastination is email. I see some head shaking, right? This may have sit up and you turn on your computer and there are all these messages match it, right? Some of them are sort of interesting and maybe there are things like a shopping thing you could do or some bargain here or there or there's uh, you know one from an old friend that came through and they want to know something there's a little bit from work and all this stuff's coming at you and all of a sudden an hour or two hours have gone by and boom you know you haven't done some other things you plan to do. So how are you going to manage that? That's a problem I have myself is getting in on data by email or other kinds of inputs to me. Yes sir? In the business world, number two and three uh, run into that type of problem a lot, especially if you've got a, a new boss and you're out of sync yeah. with that new boss on those priorities and so forth. And you, like you're struggling. It's like a dating relationship. You're you're trying to get to know each other. Right. You know, what are your expectations? You know, it, 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 you're not yeah. communicating. How do you break through that if you're struggling with? Depression, anyhow, and right. That's an excellent observation. An excellent question is: you're in a system in which you're having difficulty getting things done, and, and and particularly something where it's a new boss. I mean, you can't just sit down with that person and tell them about your depression easily, or, or ask them to give you some guidance on how to get things done. So that, that's pretty hard. I don't know. Can anybody here help me with that one? Anybody have any ideas? If you've been in a situation like that. Yeah. Tell me, you, I ask my boss what the priority is, yeah. and then I I do that, I can blame that on my okay. name. Right. Did you hear that? Yeah. You just yeah. ask the boss about what the priority is, and if you do it, then you can put some blame on the boss. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think some of it's going to be patience and getting used to one another and working on your relationship. You know, getting more collaborative and working with your boss or anyone else that you're working with, and then try to work together as a team. That's ideal. You can do that. Yeah. Um, I just we, I recently did an exercise where where uh, each each of the the uh, managers wrote down their ex their top priorities, and then the, the, the employees wrote down what they thought their top priorities were, and they got together and collaboratively. Right. That sounds like an ideal yeah, way to do came, it. Yeah. Came up with. Okay, these are my priorities. Yeah, I don't know if you heard that back there. He said that they had an exercise at his work where the bosses had their priorities and the other people had their priorities. They sat down together as a team and collaboratively worked out what the priorities would be. Perfect. That'd be the way to do it. If you're in an environment that would handle that. Now, sometimes, you know, the, the bosses aren't used to doing that or don't want to do that. Uh, but that's what you have to try to press for. So we're going to go on. Uh, and here's one of my the cartoons are really funny. You can see, you know, here you have a stack of things on your desk. Actionable, action worthy, action epic, lights, act, camera, action, action, bow, action, and then actually done. And of course, my cobwebs, right? So we want to avoid that. So here's uh, my Wright's top 10 tips. We're finally getting there. 
for overcoming procrastination. And we're going to use some of the things we've already talked about to put these 10 tips into action. So number one, set a reasonable goal. It's hard to get things done unless you have a reasonable goal. And make it specific and measurable and achievable. You've heard all this before, but this is really important to do. And here's some examples of poorly delineated goals. I've heard a lot of these. So I usually do these with the patients that come to me. I ask them what their goals might be. And they might tell me something like, uh, um, lose weight, or uh, start exercising, or something like that. And that's good. I mean, it's, it's, it's admirable that they're coming up with that. But unfortunately, it doesn't have enough meat and structure on it to really tell us whether we're getting there or not. So if we're not getting there, how are we going to get there? Uh, so we need to come up with more specific, well delineated goals. Here's an example. I'm going to exercise three times a week by walking, at least 30 minutes each time. I'm going to get up to 30 minutes within four weeks of starting the program. So that's pretty specific, isn't it? So then we can figure out, are you getting there? We can log it or something, and we could, we could then step back and, and then make some changes if we weren't getting there. Number two, build your motivation. We talked before about problems with motivation. How do you do that? Well, you identify the, mo the motivators. What are the payoffs for me of taking this step? And here's some examples. My health to live longer. And if you did that, then if you were coaching yourself or you were coaching somebody else, how would you help? Gee, I remember uh, this was pretty dramatic, but when I was in medical school, I had a friend that wanted to stop smoking. And he tried many, many times, and he hadn't been able to do it. This is a little bit of a gruesome story, but I'll tell you, because I think it gives a real good illustration of how you can get shocked and do these things. So I was an anatomy student at the time. You know, we dissect bodies. And so we were able to get into the lab, and I said, well, would you like to go see the lungs of a smoker? And he said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, if you saw him, you think it would make a difference? He said, it probably would. So what did we do? We walked over to the lab and walked in and we looked at about five or six sets of lungs that were blackened and gnarled up and you know really sick. And then we looked at some lungs of people that hadn't been smokers and it was a vast difference. And that was just a huge motivator for him. And he stopped smoking. I've heard from him, it's been a long time ago. Now that's pretty dramatic, but you can also use motivators that might come up from scenes on the internet. Like you might look at some things that might help motivate you. Uh, you might uh, say, what would maybe your kid's motivation? Because you want to live longer for your children. And if you're going to try to amplify that, how might you do that? Well, you might take some photos and put them in a motivating kit that you take a look at a couple times a day. Or put them on the refrigerator. Or put them with your written out plan that we're going to talk about later. Things that really key to motivation. If I'm a coach working with somebody that wants to say, stop smoking, and they say something like, well, I want to... Uh, I would want to be, breathe, be able to breathe better. Then I'll amplify that and what that means, but then I'll also ask them about other things. How about other aspects of your health? And they might not know much about effects of cigarette smoking on the heart or blood vessels or your skin. I say, what, what does it do to your skin as you get older? And some people don't even know that, but if you're a smoker and you smoke for 30 or 40 years, your skin looks a whole lot different. You know, it's all you know, wrinkled and rough and coarse as opposed to somebody that hasn't smoked. Uh, how about, I might ask, how about uh, the finances of smoking? Does that make a difference? And they say, well, let's add it up. What's the, what's the cigarette back cost for me? And then we add it all up. Well, what would you do with that money? So those are all kinds of questions that I'm going to use to try to help motivate that person. You can do that for yourself. You can do it with people that you're trying to help with this sort of thing. Then look at the demotivators. They're things that are going to get in the way. Um, the person might say, well, I, every time I sit down to write, this is writer, I've got, to, I've got to light up, and I can't get going without it, and I'm not going to be able to produce anything. So that could be a problem, so you have to think how you're going to get around it. Is there any alternate behavior that could be done that's reasonable, it's not going to hurt the person? Or could they have a cup of decaffeinated tea or something that might help them, ease, get them into the rhythm of their writing? Number three, think for success. This is all that cognitive stuff I was telling you about before. So we want to identify these negative thoughts that are contributing to procrastination. Look at those thoughts, examine the evidence, check it out. Is it true or not? It's not quite true. Can you change it? Watch for words like never and always. They're indicators that you're in trouble with that kind of thought. And then write down a rational set of thoughts about yourself. It's going to help you get through this. 
get organized, number four. So how are you going to actually accomplish this plan? If you're going to start an exercise program, how is it going to fit into your schedule? Can you decide on a specific time that's going to be done and commit yourself to that? That's worked for me in my own life. I was not an exerciser a long time ago, and I had a hard time getting started, but then I decided I was going to do it at certain times of the day, and I negotiated that with my family. And my kids were young at that time, and my wife was having a job, and so working that into the schedule was pretty tough. Uh, but they could see there was a payoff for that because I was gaining weight and you know, I wasn't feeling as well as I might, and so we worked out that plan, and I've stick, stuck to it all these years. It's been very helpful. So setting a time and place that makes sense to you and making some kind of commitment to that is really important. If you can work out the schedule with key players, great. If you can make it routine, great. So how many of you do something like exercise or some other positive behavior and you do it on a routine basis? Look at all these hands come out. This is great. Could you give me an example? Do you love what, what do you do? I reserve Thursday mornings every week to go out to the gym. So if nothing else ever happens on the week, I know every Thursday I will exercise. Yeah, great. So she every Thursday morning you go to the gym. There's I nothing do. else on her schedule. She does it. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes? Silver sneakers class twice a week. Right. Very good. So she does that silver sneakers class. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 part of my job is to write. And what I when I started writing a long time ago, I wasn't very good at it. I was used to procrastinating. You couldn't believe it. I mean, I spent a year trying to write one single article. And that was back before I could type. And the room I was in was like littered with yellow legal pads all crumpled up and things like this. You know, nothing was getting accomplished. And so I then read a book about what makes a successful writer. And one of the things I found out was that this romantic notion about like Ernest Hemingway getting his inspiration and writing these wonderful things in a dash of, you know, post-alcoholic euphoria or something, really not true that most successful writers have to carve out time that they are going to devote. It's just like showing up at work and punching in the clock. It might be 8 to 12 on a certain morning and you're going to do it. And that's what I've done. And it's really paid off. So that's, that's been a really helpful kind of thing to make those kind of commitments. Uh, do you know much about circadian rhythms? Uh, circadian, circadian means that it's the schedule that you have in a 24-hour period. And it turns out that human beings are designed to live a life of regularity, not of irregularity. And if they have regular wake times in the morning, seven days a week, and reasonably regular sleep times when they go to bed, and regular meals, and regular other activities like exercise, or work, or pleasurable events, things like that, they tend to do a lot better. They're more productive, but they also have a, a, a regularization of their hormone rhythms in the body. We have lots of hormones. We have things like thyroid hormone, we have growth hormone, cortisol, female hormones, male hormones. And if you put a catheter in a person's arm and drew a blood sample every hour and then analyzed it in the lab, you see a, in a, in a person had a very regular circadian rhythm, you'd see a nice smooth curve of these hormones here today. They're all a little different, the cortisol and the, and the uh, like the estrogens and the testosterone and so forth. But you see a nice kind of pattern. People that have irregular lives, particularly those that have things like manic depressive illness and they're all over the place, not sleeping for three days in a row, something like that. If you look at these patterns, they're like this. All dysregulated. So if you can have a regularity to your life, it helps to get things done. Yes, sir. How do you, or how does one discover their own uniqueness of their circadian rhythm right. to bring it back into where it is more of a response to one's internal clock yeah. in response, in contact <coughs> to what is happening within them, their past history, but also these times. Yeah, I like that question. It's how does one find out what the best rhythm is for you? Yes. Um, yeah, th th we do have unique rhythms. Some people need to sleep more than others. Uh, some people uh, are night owls, other people are best if they get to bed by 9 o'clock at night and they're up early in the morning. Uh, I'm sort of like that. I'm, I'm an early morning riser and I find that I'm much more productive. It's of it's trial and error. I've learned that if I, if I uh, get to bed at around 10.30 or night or so, not later than 11, and I'm up around 6, 6.30, and get a good 8 hours of sleep, that 
that that day works a whole lot better than if I don't do that kind of thing. But there are a lot of differences. So you just experiment and find out what works best for you. But if, if the prevailing belief systems of, of the academy are predicated on a circadian rhythm that is natural and flowing, what about the irregular rhythms or those which not, may be just as important but not recognized as yeah. being a part of what is making things happen? I think you're asking about unusual rhythms or ones that don't fit the, the standard pattern. Of course, the people that have it's those. Why. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know the answer. Here's the science that you plot. Yeah. So yeah. here's a regular chronos. Yeah, I don't know the answer to, to, to that question about whether, you know, an irregular rhythm works better than, you know, a standard kind of a rhythm. Uh, but I do know that the dysrhythmias hmm. are associated with greater incidence of mental illness and lack of being able to get things done. Hmm. Yeah. I really believe what you're saying is because I'm, I'm getting help with that, with those rhythms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And when he explained it to me, I really didn't believe it. And I've been working on it for over two months now. And try going to bed at a certain time, up at a certain time. Yeah. I mean, it has changed. It'll make I was difference. not getting yeah. much sleep. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that can help most with sleep is the regularity of the wake time in the morning. That's the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people think that, well, if I stay up late on Friday night, I can sleep in Saturday morning and Sunday morning, or I can catch up from being exhausted from the week before. That doesn't work so well. It actually screws up the sleep the next week. So you're better off seven days a week, same kind of thing. Yes, sir? As a doctor, you get all kind of interruptions. How does that affect your circadian rhythm? Uh, it's not so good. Particularly as you get a little older, which I am now, you know, as you get older, your sleep is less uh, effective. It's more aroused. You know, we have stages of sleep from one through four, and four is the deepest sleep. But by the time you get into your 60s, you have none of that, really. And your sleep is very aroused, so it becomes more difficult. So now when I get a call in the middle of the night, it's hard for you to go back to sleep. Yeah. My son, who's a surgeon, tells me that uh, at their program, Surgeons don't take call any longer after they hit 60. Because they're concerned that the surgeon who has to be able to get up in the middle of the night and go and operate and the person's life is on the line, they gotta be sharp. Whereas psychiatrists, you know, I'm not, I'm not operating on people. I can tell you, I think I mean, we have to have my voice in my mouth have a pretty good answer. If someone calls in the middle of the night and they're in trouble, I want to be able to respond to them. Yeah, it's not quite the same thing. Do you have any thoughts about napping? Uh, yeah, that's a, a bit of a controversial topic. Uh, if you have real sleep problems, mm -hmm. really bad insomnia, generally the recommendation is to try to avoid naps. But there are certainly people that naps work very well for them. My mother, who turns 100 on February 17th, has taken a nap every afternoon, right at 1 o'clock, for years. And it works great for her. You know, it's just it's part of her rhythm. That works fine. If I took a nap at 1 o'clock and, you know, she closed my office and went to sleep, I probably would be wasted for the rest of the day. It's like, you know, just the way I am. I, you know, you get sort of moved for sleep. It wouldn't be so good. Probably wouldn't sleep that well that night. So, again, we all have individual differences here on this. And if you went to a clinic for sleep disorders and you had what's called ICBT or CBTI, which is CBT for insomnia, they're probably going to want to discourage you from taking naps. And why, that, why you do that is it increases your sleep drive at night you're more likely to want to go to sleep and sleep deeply when you don't have anything to do the day. And we need to go on to get through all these 10 points by 8 o'clock and have time for questions. <laughs> you're, all, you're a great audience. You have lots of good questions and observations. Okay. Organize the workspace for optimum results. Did you find that's helpful to you? I sure do. Yeah, if you have a, a, a desk or a workspace that's orderly and things are great to get out, much uh, easier to get things done. Number five, lay the groundwork. So if you have a goal that you've set up, then try to do a little bit of research or preparation in advance. If you're going to start an exercise program, do you have the right equipment? Um, if you're going to um, take up cooking, you know, do you have the right kind of equipment to do that or something like that? 
take a step by step. I think somebody already mentioned this. I believe you did. But the young woman with the sweater. Sure. So this is called the step by step approach, and everybody's done this. Everybody knows this. But somehow we don't seem to be able to put it into action as well as we might most of the time. This is the idea of taking a task that seems pretty daunting, maybe even overwhelming. Maybe we failed at it before, it hasn't worked out, and try to dissect out the individual pieces of it and try to set it up so that you're going to take it as a step that's manageable for you to begin with. Um, so if I'm going to write a new book chapter, which might take me, who knows, 100 hours to do all the background research and all that kind of thing. If I stick with, gee, how am I going to ever get this done? How am I going to work in my schedule? I'm not going to be able to get a handle. It's going to be too much for me. I'm going to be discouraged and not get it done. But if I think, okay, here's what I'm going to do to get this organized. First, I'm going to just simply write an outline. If I can get that done today, I'm okay. Next step, I'm going to think, who am I going to have help me with this? Kirk Barrett's going to help me with this. <laughs> I'm going to ask him to do the hard work here. No, they don't always do that, but you know, I might be thinking of helpers that might come along the way, and then I'm thinking of orderly steps, and I might even have a schedule for how I'm going to do that, a work plan. It's, it's right now. So, let's go ahead. Prepare for barriers and setbacks. That's number seven. Yes, Clint? Yeah, a good example of that kind of uh, approach is a uh, 12-step uh, recovery. One oh, day yeah. Time. yeah. Yeah, very very good yeah. you mentioned that. Sure. Think of how I'm ever going to overcome this addiction. Yeah. You just get to the feet. You just go to the meeting. Do the first thing. All right? Stay with it. Thanks for making that observation. So prepare for barriers and setbacks. If you're thinking about a, a thing that you want to overcome, things you want to stop procrastinating with, it helps to even in advance think about what will get in the way. What's going to stop you from doing this? Uh, and then figure out how you're going to overcome those obstacles. And if they occur, do yourself a favor. Don't criticize yourself too much. Don't give up right away. But try to reformulate it and come back at it and uh, keep going. Number eight, reach out for support. Is there anybody that can help you? I just gave an example of asking my colleague to help you with the project. Uh, if you need an exercise buddy, uh, someone that you love that would be on your side, that would help ask, ask you some questions or give you some support to get through it, help you with some little rewards if you make progress, which is the next step. Reward yourself. Number nine, anybody ever do this when they're trying to accomplish something? What kind of rewards have you given yourself? Anybody admit mm -hmm. that? Yes. If I like have to work on something or do a chore or something, I do it for like a set amount of time, like 50 minutes, and then I get like 10 or 20 minutes to like read my book or yeah. whatever. Okay, like, great. So you give yourself some time if you accomplish 50 minutes worth and take a break. Sure. Yeah. Well, a cheat day when it comes to diet is always. Yeah. A cheat day. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, don't be so rigid that you can't have a really good dinner out. Just let it rip. Yeah, I like that one. How about some other ones that you might reward yourself with? Some people put big rewards for, you know, the really big tasks that take them a long time to get them done. Like they might decide to, to take a little vacation or, uh, you know, go to a special movie or go out to dinner or something like that. It would be something that they would reward themselves with if they accomplish a task. And now we're to 10. So this last idea is to take all these common sense approaches we've been talking about, and many of you are already doing these, and put them all together and, and write out a plan, and then log what you're doing. So this has been one of the common findings in research on all kinds of behavior change, from <laughs> diet to stopping smoking to stopping gambling, to anything that you're trying to change, and that's to log your activities. If you're trying to lose weight, log what you're eating. Write it down using calorie counts. You can even do this online sometimes now. Some nice apps to be able to allow you to do this. I remember when I first started exercising, uh, this was back when the running craze first came along. And I got a log book, and for three years, every run I took, I wrote down. And I even wrote down like how human it was, <laughs> and you know, what time I had, and, that kind of stuff. I don't know why. I was sort of obsessed by it. 
<laughs> but, but I do think that it helped me. Now I could look at it, I could see progress. That was more accountable. Weight Watchers used to that, doesn't it? You have a check in? So those, most successful behavior programs have some accountability. If you write it down, you're accountable to yourself. And if you have a coach that's working with you, or a therapist, or a friend, or something, they can help you do that. So we're supposed to unlock our potential. And I'm going to end with one cartoon that I like. So, has this ever happened to you? You have someone telling you, you've got pussy footing from 10 to 11, chilly shouting <laughs> until 12, and hemming and hawing the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> now, I hope for all of you that that is not the outcome of this presentation. <laughs> so, we're finished with the presentation, but I wonder if there are other questions or observations or things that you found that we haven't, that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, yes, Kurt. Just probably like everybody else in the room, I never come to one of your presentations without walking away with a pearl. And uh, the pearl tonight for me was when you mentioned something I'd never thought about it, and that is that bad behavior can be reinforcing. And it, it, take, it takes on the qualities of a positive reinforcer, which I don't know of anybody that talks about. But uh, the, uh, the effect of that is... Uh, I, I think outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. That's that's an uh, interesting observation. If you get into a behavioral pattern that's not very effective, that in of itself becomes reinforcing. It's you know part of your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cliff. One thing that I thought of while you were talking, especially about uh, uh, maybe calling, uh, getting some assistance and that kind. There's an interpersonal element that uh, uh, maybe we be an 11th step if you really uh, want to flesh it out of, uh, of uh, connecting with a group or an individual and uh, not only does that create an accountability uh, but you also then begin to uh, overcome the effects of isolation in the uh, effort and if you're, you're you have a common yeah. goal uh, and you're trading you know when somebody trips then you don't feel like you're the only one who's tripping or falling short uh, at yeah, times. And so that, that interpersonal thing could almost be an 11th. Uh, you got it. Yeah. Okay. And how about we go from 12? And even doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have one? Like to have? I bet there is one somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah, forget sure. to laugh. Yeah, don't forget to laugh. <laughs> oh, I love it. I have to yeah, we have to do it. Yeah, leverage the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you, Cliff. So I, I think we'll take a couple more questions, and I'd like to pretty much leave on that point, though. Yes. So I used to call wood. I did a lot. It was good, but now I have all these wood companies up in my attic. They just sit there. So I'm like, well, who's the point of doing all that? Because now all my guys. Just study, just sit around. So my, I have a real lack of motivation because I'm like, in the long term, what's the point? Okay. Do you have any suggestion for getting around that? Well, we go back to the things that would motivate you to make that change. And if you don't, if you if you really think about it thoroughly, and you give it your best, and they're not things that motivate you, unless it's a huge problem in your life, maybe it's something you don't need to do. I mean, there are things like that, aren't there? I mean, of all the tasks you might have in your life, you do need to make some decisions about which ones you really throw yourself into and which ones you don't. And otherwise, you're all over the place. So maybe that one for you is one that's not that important to do anyway. Um, Anybody have anything like that that they sort of push off the side for a while? It's okay. It's not just procrastination. Yeah, if yeah. I heard you correctly, you're talking about wood carving. Is that yeah. what you said? A hobby? Mm -hmm. So, what if you got hooked up with these flea markets or these steamboat festivals or whatever and you displayed your work, your art, yeah. sold it for inexpensive whatever? It would just it would get you out there, plus, it would eliminate some of the things out there. And if you continue on with this hobby. You're being a great coach, thank you. She said, what if you went to a. Uh, you, you took your stuff and displayed it at a, <laughs> a fair or something like that? Sure. Um, did that help you at all? Well, 
And I don't mean to be negative. I have no motivation. I gave it a good try, though. I gave it a great try. And sometimes it's like that. I guess why I didn't jump over that one is I, I took a wood carving class back when I was a, a resident in psychiatry. And I still have the, I still have these blocks of wood and all the tools down in my basement. And I hate to tell you how long ago that was. So it's not one of my top priorities. So I don't know. We, but I hope that all of you will think about something in your own life that you really do want to get done. That you really do want to change. You want to make a change. And you try to use some of the things that, that we talked about tonight and that you've learned from our, your neighbors here that have all been very helpful in coming up with suggestions and ideas. I think we're going to wrap at that point because it's, it's time to go back home and, and get to work, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank and you. Come to your